so what we thought we'd start off with is giving them a chance each to kind of introduce themselves and uh, tell you a little bit about themselves and their galleries uh, and their background so that it kind of situates us for the day and uh, everything that comes after will kind of make sense. Uh, so, Paul, did you want to start today? Um, sure. Okay. We talked amongst ourselves and figured I'd start because I'm sort of the veteran on the panel and um, so I'll try and keep it brief, but I have been around for a while and um, should touch on a few bases just to kind of get us a foundation going. So um, I, uh, um, after uh, acquiring a degree in English literature in Toronto, I moved down to Queen Street West and I joined the, um, the artist-run um, sort of uh, community. And um, in Montreal, your equivalents are like Optica and Skull, Dazzy Bao, um, Obero, etc. And uh, one of my earlier accomplishments in that area was helping to um, found the organization InterAccess. Back then it was Toronto Community Video Text, but it was an artist-run center that's thriving to this day and it moved around the Toronto and it's around the corner from my gallery now, so it's a nice full circle thing, sort of 30 plus years later. And um, that background's kind of pertinent to the Ed Atkins show that's at DHC right now, which I managed to see before the fair started, and I encourage people to go. Uh, see, I'm already digressing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, so, but I think it's important to understand that I do come out of artist-run culture. I had a studio practice um, um, and uh, developed my independent curatorial practice around the same time because I was interested in, in the new technologies, which is what it was called at the time and um, how artists were taking them up. So my earliest curatorial projects were in new media. And that also included um, uh, research and production grants from the Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council, etc. And so um, in the midst of all of that activity, and this is at A Space, Trinity Square Video, artists here might know about those organizations um, more than maybe the collecting community because in the Artist Run Centre Network there isn't such a dominant commercial imperative going on. You're, you apply for funding from the government. In fact, in 1985, um, and I was sort of like the young one amongst this uh, group of artists that formed the Toronto, the Independent Artists Union. And the idea there was that we were um, uh, working for the state um, as cultural workers and being employed by the arts councils. That's where our monies were coming. So, in, and the focus wasn't on market. Or if it was on market, it was more on issues around consumerism and um, identity politics and value was discussed in terms of value systems, not value in related to the market, except to deconstruct those market principles and understand them and reflect them back to um, uh, the, uh, the audience for contemporary art. For me at the time, largely in Toronto, but I moved around the country at different artist run centers. <clears throat> Anyhow, I didn't get a renewal on a grant and I needed money and there was a job opening in a prominent Yorkville gallery who were showing international artists and so I, I walked in there and I was hired and I only knew a couple of Canadian artists there, the rest of the program was more international and so the first show was an Andy Warhol exhibition and the works were chosen and purchased at Warhol Studio brought to Toronto and I, I was like the gallery slave and I, I opened the crates and handled the work and just, those were my formative commercial gallery experiences starting with Warhol and Gerhard Richter, Francesco Clemente, like really interesting international artists and I couldn't believe I was holding them and turning them around and looking at the back of the stretcher, etc. But also having my, wise, my eyes widen to the, um, um, <clears throat> to the market aspect of the operation. And around that time, we were coming out of a recession, and in the Globe and Mail, they started covering auctions. And all of a sudden, that became, that broadened the public, and that auction arena, which used to be more about wholesaling work to dealers who sell them to collectors, opened up and became the retailing spectacle that it is now. So that was a really interesting thing to discover. And then the other thing during that period was that, um, um, that was, uh, so it was September 86 when we had the Warhol show, and then Warhol died in February 87, and I watched, I was in this bird's eye view to watch what happened to the market. The paintings tripled, the works, on the drawings doubled, and there was a little bump up in the print aspect. 
but we know where that has gone from then to now uh, with respect to the market and um, uh, Warhol. So all of that. Um, Josh, hi. <laughs> um, and so um, I, uh, I worked at that gallery for several years and then um, it opened a second one in, in Florida and I worked in Miami for a couple of winters and then I was asked to stay there permanently. I said, there's just absolutely no way I could do that. And that's when I broke from that seven year commercial gallery experience and um, started my own. So that puts us at 93. So from then to now, basically. Um, so my first chapter of that part of the journey uh, was three years in, a, in an experimental space at Young and King where I, I knew people who owned, actually Montreal people, who owned um, an office building at Young and King and they had a, an unrented retail space with a vitrine that was 48 feet long, 15 feet high and 5 feet deep. And so for three years I, I programmed work and during that time work started to sell. And um, Oh, I should back up and say when I left the uh, commercial gallery, I had job offers come to me from Los Angeles, New York, and uh, Miami, and I, I turned them all down because coming out of artist run culture, and I'll probably come back to that to remind you, um, I, uh, I was more interested in participating in our own culture and, um, and a living culture and uh, <clears throat> drilling deeper there rather than going elsewhere. Like, why would I want to do that, even for a second? And so, um, three years of that, and then I, um, in spite of myself, and um, it, to no great surprise from other Toronto dealers, I opened a proper space. Just a space that was more interpretable from a, a collecting community standpoint. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, it's sort of been from then to now, where I've programmed. Um, I recently had to quantify it because somebody asked me, so 300 exhibitions. Um, knowing full well the whole time that I, I gave them my all and that um, I, I wasn't really commercially motivated. Like that was, has never really been a guiding principle. The imperative is there. We talked about the roller coaster that it is, but you get used to how that feels. And I sort of sit on the platform watching it go up and down, uh, the vagaries of the economy, collectors moving to the next shiny object, um, you know, and just what loyalties are and mean uh, from the artist community, the collecting community, other stakeholders like corporate and institutional museum collectors, who I, I deal with all of those, like they're all a part of my, um, my um, the community um, that comes together around art. Maybe I'll just leave it at that and you guys can go. You know what my big question for you is, uh, for how do you keep your motivation? How do you have a career that is so successful. I can answer that. Going back I, so much, so long, a lot of us are kind of, you know, uh, a lot of people are struggling to decide what they're going to do with their galleries uh, and stay excited. How do you manage to do that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by successful. <laughs> you know what? Anybody who keeps their door open uh, mm -hmm. and shows up and puts their shows on and does it, that's successful. Right. Uh, I, I made so. a decision early on um, because I, before I opened my own gallery, I was I had a, an, uh, a studio practice and um, a developing curatorial practice, and then I started working in this commercial gallery, and I kept thinking about how I would do things differently, or just you know stuff like that, and you accumulate a lot of um, um, ideas around how you would do things, and. Um, and I, at the same time, well, close to the, I mean, I could tell what, that I was going to stop doing that and, and go on my own. I realized that um, um, I'd have to, number one, uh, self-generate revenues. Um, I wasn't going to think about arts councils because they don't fund um, entrepreneurial, commercial, gallery, whatever things. I knew, the, I knew that I didn't fit into that category, but I knew it would take a lot of effort on my part to... Um, make my um, agenda understood to arts councils to a point where they would respond favorably. And of course, responding favorably is, is um, the, the juries are your peers, you know, and they're operating at arm's length from the agency. Um, but I thought to myself, do I really want to continue cultivating and extending that relationship or do I really want to become more self-reliant? And if that means generating the revenues yourself. And so I, um, I, I basically took that leap. 
And, um, uh, and so when you, when, you know, when, to go back to success, I, you know, I've, I've been at it for quite a while. And um, uh, uh, I really feel like I'm talking a lot about myself. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, uh, next is, is uh, thank you so much. We'll come back to you uh, with lots of good questions. Uh, Michelle, uh, you have a lot of experience. You've worked in Los Angeles. You've worked in London, and now you're bringing all your goodness uh, to Edmonton. <laughs> uh, so tell us yes. about kind of where, where you've been and, and how you find yourself at DC3 Art Projects. Sure. Um, I mean, as Paul's talking about coming out of artist-run culture, that's actually where David Candler, the founder of DC3 Art Projects, and myself first met. Um, so back in probably 2006, we were both involved in an artist-run center in Edmonton called Latitude 53, um, sort of a contemporary center in the city. And I moved away after that, and I moved over to the UK um, to pursue a master's in contemporary art at the Sotheby's Institute there. And after uh, finishing my degree, or actually at the same time as I was finishing my degree, um, I opened up a project space in East London with three other Sotheby's graduates. So it was in a sort of massive construction space in London Fields in Hackney. Um, and we did a lot of sort of experimental programming. We did a lot of work with sound and installation and video and educational programming there. Um, and while I was in London, I was sort of consulting with various organizations. I was working for Freeze Art Fair there. I was doing East End curatorial tours with Whitechapel Gallery. I was working with IBRAS, a publication that focuses on art from the Middle East and North Africa, uh, serving as London correspondent for Daily Serving. So uh, sort of hands in a lot of, a lot of things. Um, I was offered the opportunity to then open a contemporary commercial gallery in Los Angeles. So I moved to LA in 2012 um, and ran a space there for three years, essentially. Um, immigration became very difficult and I decided to move back to Canada. I showed up at one of David's openings in Edmonton and um, we just started talking. And he, it was a sort of perfect timing where he had a couple of people working with him that were going back to grad school and sort of was in a position to offer me um, a full-time directorship at the gallery. So I joined David there about a year and a half ago now. Um, so if the background of the gallery, essentially David Candler uh, is the founder and director of DC3 Art Projects. He started it in 2012. Um, he's sort of a long-term, long-time collector um, and self-described art junkie, essentially. Um, so it's a, it's a commercial contemporary gallery, technically, in Edmonton. Um, but we've recently come across a term that we quite like, and we describe it now as a negative profit exhibition space. Uh, that I think comes that's out something of, that, that a lot of galleries can, can uh, Exactly. Can it's a <laughs> commercial space with negative profit. That came out of Evans Contemporary, actually, in Peterborough, which is how they describe themselves on their website. Um, so we've adopted that. Um, but we work with emerging and mid-career artists, um, and we basically are trying to get work from Edmonton outside of Edmonton, um, and also bring work into Edmonton. Um, so we do a lot of art fairs, um, and we try and do a lot of pop-up exhibitions, and show what I would consider to be challenging programming in Edmonton. And, and this year has been a very a big year uh, for you. you just, yes. Uh, just did Volta New York yes. uh, for the first time, yep. and now you're preparing to go to Volta Basel in we Switzerland are, yes, during we're Art joining Basel you there. Week. So that's that's yeah. really a big accomplishment. Congratulations! Thank you. Yeah, uh, that was always. I think when David started the gallery, Volta was always an art fair that he had on his radar. Um, just the the attention that they pay to solo projects, I think, is really important, and it's kind of how we've always approached art fairs as well as an exhibition in themselves. Um, just as a way to bring artists outside of the city and show work that is sort of in a, in a comprehensive exhibition, I guess. Um, so Volta is a fair that I think we've both always kept an eye on and respected, and it was sort of a 10-year goal for him, like 10 years after the gallery opened. Um, but we were given the opportunity to go to New York this past year um, and bring a solo project down there, and then from that we are now going to Basel, Switzerland, which we are very excited about. That's wonderful. So uh, you were originally from Edmonton. 
Uh, I went to university in Edmonton. I kind okay. of grew up all over, actually in southern Manitoba as well as right. Alberta. Um, I'm just looking for the motivation where you go from London to Los Angeles. Yeah, back to Edmonton. And back, no, but, but yeah. it's perfectly normal. Wherever we go, yeah. we always think of where we're from. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's an amazing thing uh, in today's art market that people aren't so cynical that they feel that they have to move to big to big urban, right. I mean, Edmonton is a big urban center, but right. you've created culture there. Uh, you've gone someplace where uh, maybe something didn't uh, didn't exist and you kind of filled a space. Exactly, and I think that that sort of work can be far more rewarding. Like, I ran a space in Los Angeles for three years, and you're one gallery in a sea of hundreds of galleries. Right. But in Edmonton, we're sort of... You know, we have our own space, and we don't really have to compete with anybody there. Right. And there's not sort of um, there's not the same sort of pressure, and there's just a lot more space, I guess, to right. to be able to do what we want to do. Wonderful, and the space is beautiful, and and you're yeah, here. well, and that's the thing and we could here. never we could never have a space like that in in Montreal, or Toronto, or Los Angeles. Yeah, you know, exactly. that sort of massive warehouse space that we we can get away with in Edmonton. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, Lisa, I find you totally fascinating. <laughs> uh, Thank you. There was a day when there was no Lisa Kaler art projects, and then suddenly the next day there was Lisa Kaler art projects. And she, for me, she kind of, I thought I knew what was going on, and then suddenly she appeared out of nowhere with a beautiful gallery, smart. Uh, it looked like a gallery that had been around for 10 years. Uh, beautifully programmed, great artists. Uh, and there you are, and now you just, you're part of the landscape, and you're here with everybody doing all the great things you're doing. Uh, so how did you get there? Um, well, I kind of came out of a more academic background where I did an undergrad in art history, um, and then I was actually through um, AG or ADAC and Service Canada that I was offered an internship with a commercial gallery in Vancouver. So it was a seven month internship to give people with more of the academic background some real commercial experience. So that ended up turning into a position where I ran the gallery for about two years. And there's one of the artists I got to work with, Brad Woodfin. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was there for two years um, and then just sort of moved around Canada for the next five, six years. I was in Halifax for a while. I was working with the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, um, working with their Young Patron Circle, so kind of more on the development side. Um, then moved back to Winnipeg, where I worked with Border Crossings Magazine for two years as the Special Projects Director. Again, more on the development side engagement. Um, and I was also doing my master's in curatorial practices there, which was a new program. So, so that explains everything. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of all over the, the place, really, in publications, in writing. I was writing for Akimbo for a while. Um, but then I was sort of looking around and seeing that there were no critical contemporary commercial galleries in Winnipeg. And we have this amazing amount of talent. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have been to Winnipeg, but we just have some incredible artists that come out of there. Um, and uh, so I sort of looked around and thought there's this hole. And the thing about Winnipeg is that it seems to be more of an artist-run culture in that city. Um, but I spoke with so many artists and they were all feeling like maybe the time was right. We were all kind of getting a little bit older. And so this crew of younger artists were now actually making some money or had friends that were making money. <laughs> so we thought, hey, let's try this gallery. So um, some really significant artists signed on with me and we all sort of looked at it more as like a collaboration. Um, and so yeah, in August, July of 2015, we opened up our first show, which was Paul Butler. Um, it was a solo show. It was actually his first solo show in over a decade in his hometown, which was sort of a bizarre thing. But this is what happens when there's no, no commercial galleries in, in that particular city. Winnipeg is a very, very tricky market. Um, it's really heavily steeped because there's, there were no commercial galleries in that space. Everybody relied and still does rely heavily on uh, fundraisers, which um, in a small market or an, 
uh, non-market really, um, when there is these opportunities to acquire works by these really significant artists at a fraction of the cost that you would pay in another city, people jump on that. So what happens is because it's such a really significant artist-run culture, um, there's really important uh, organizations there so maybe there's like five fundraisers per year so you're generally going to be able to acquire work for uh, at, a, at a low price yeah, that definitely affects the market oh it's especially it's, when it's, you're it's really it's been a real challenge and and honestly with the artists too they're in this really interesting position where they feel that they want to support the organizations that support them um, but nine times out of ten they don't get any of the profits from that it's it's quite different than most cities where the the artists get a fraction or a portion of the sale it's they get um, tax receipts and most artists most emerging artists will tell you that they don't really need <laughs> tax nobody, receipts. nobody we want income we don't yeah. want deductions yeah, that's what we're looking for yeah. so um, yeah that's been a consistent challenge but yeah so I have this really beautiful space this lovely gallery um, I've just been, everything that I sell and make, I put right back into it, um, and yeah, so, yeah. And that doesn't stop, you're always putting it back yeah. in, it's always right. going back in. Well, it's interesting because it's tax time right now, so you're uh, taking a look at everything that you've done throughout the year, and uh, you really, you know, you take stock of what you've actually done and, and what's come in and what's come out, but most galleries, they make money, but and they invest it right back into their gallery. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, and it, I don't think it ever stops, like you're saying, Paul, so. What, what, what I find interesting is that uh, what we're lucky to have today is three people from three different areas of the country. Uh, and I'm always fascinated, and being from Ottawa, when I started my gallery back in 2006, being in Ottawa, uh, I think what fascinates me is what effect geography has on your program, on your mentality, how you approach things, the decisions you make, uh, the artists you work with, the type of program that you're building. And I think uh, you're all looking beyond geography. Uh, what I find is, uh, Paul, you're in Toronto and there's this conception that Toronto is the best market in the country and everybody has it easy, the money is flowing in, <laughs> you can do anything, you can work with anyone, and the results are going to be good because people are lining up uh, to buy art. Is that true? Well, uh, going back to this um, uh, independent artist union model that I was describing earlier, statistically, 60% um, uh, of um, the artists' community in Canada um, are in Toronto. They, they come to Toronto. Only 3% of uh, living Canadian artists derive their full income from the sale of their work or through their practice and that could you know guest lecturing um, and this is without teaching but just you know gigging and sales of work and then that in between no well, sixty percent are below the poverty line that's what the statistic is sorry um, but the majority of um, um, living and working Canadian artists historically has been in Toronto but that's changing uh, because it's becoming too expensive a city to, um, to, to live and work in and have um, adequate studio space. It just becomes harder, but um, things being hard is something that artists and um, uh, younger gallerists know all about, and out of hard times comes great stuff, and out of recessions, like when you're, recessions are very invigorating, healthy times within the artist community, ironically. Um, <clears throat> wondering where I should take it from. So there. was that yes or no? <laughs> uh, was that? That was oh, like, Toronto? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of Canada? If you're in Montreal working, if you're in Edmonton, if you're in Winnipeg, I think isn't this kind of like the feeling that Toronto is the golden market? That there is, or, okay, so how do you, Lisa and Michelle, how do you, what is your mentality when you're programming your space? You, you really have to kind of think outside your boundaries of your city. You have to think globally. You have to look at what, what's happening in the world. Uh, and, and what are the decisions that you make uh, in terms of resisting this feeling that you have to be a local gallery? Because I'm sure you get people walking in to your galleries that don't really understand what you're doing. 
but you have to kind of stick to your vision uh, and keep in mind, and the same goes for you, Paul, uh, you have to kind of stick to your vision, look at the world, look what's happening, and, and kind of, and you're, I mean, you're going, you're zooming from Edmonton to Switzerland, you zoomed from Winnipeg to Los Angeles mm -hmm. just this year doing fairs and participating in the market. What, what happens in your, what kind of mentality do you have to have to kind of achieve that? Um, in my, when I first started the gallery, the whole focus was that it was going to be Winnipeg artists in Winnipeg. So I was on, that was part of the requirement was that you were either from Winnipeg or you identified as a pegger. Um, I noticed within a year that this was somewhat, um, this model wouldn't work. Uh, again, going back to the fundraiser idea, I needed to bring in other artists who were not uh, necessarily part of that whole crew. And I also thought, you know, thinking regionally isn't maybe the best way to reflect what's happening in the art world. Um, bringing in artists from um, the States, I worked with Daniel Johnston, who is this infamous outsider musician and artist, um, and, and the impact that just even bringing one artist from outside Winnipeg had was significant. Um, but I think that, you know, when I first opened the gallery, people would come in and say they didn't even understand what commercial gallery meant. Uh, because there's such a lack of, of that, in, that type of institution in the city, like, does that mean that the work is for sale? Like, I'm seriously walking people through the whole concept of buying art, and <laughs> so it, it's, it's a little bit different, but um, yeah, so of course we look at Toronto, um, just because of the sheer population of the city, the amount of money that's there. Um, so I do Art Toronto, uh, and I was doing feature when it was running, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of our mecca in, <laughs> in terms of where the collectors are. But I mean, I, I sell all over the place, so like the tiniest, like Grand Prairie, Alberta, <laughs> who I'm sure you deal with as well. Um, Halifax, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of all over. But of course, we look to, to Toronto because of its, I mean, it's, it is kind of the... Well, I, guess, I guess apparently the pot of gold is there, but... Um... <laughs> antithetical to that whole idea. I spent a five-year period where I would close my gallery every September and come to Montreal. Yeah. And I did that from 96 through 2000. And so I would find a space in the Belgo. Everything was alloué back then, so you could secure a space four months in advance so that you could promote the fact that you were coming and who you were showing. Um, René Bloin helped me out initially by uh, letting me rent the space across the hall from him and then just on the fifth floor it seemed to be my magic uh, you know spot and so I did that for five years in spite of the fact that people were really a little and people in Toronto were like there's no market in Montreal but I you know I, I kind of um, found out for myself and um, and I just found it a very interesting profitable experience maybe not profitable financially, but I didn't really care. I wasn't thinking in those terms. Um, and when I came back to Toronto every time, I would think to myself, wow, OHIP should give people in Ontario one week in Montreal just to lead a more balanced life. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it paid cultural dividends for me. And um, so when I think about value, I think about cultural value rather than, uh, I mean, I have to think about price and things like that. but. Um, but um, there's more than one type of value. It's like there's this one Tro Montreal artist who's in Toronto now, Nell Tenhoff, and many years ago in uh, Joyce Yehuda's first gallery, she had a show of interactive um, video text, so interactive computer graphics. It was, it was sort of like uh, the dawning age of uh, telebanking and you know, shopping online, that kind of thing. And uh, she had a, a piece that she did called Shopping for Value Systems which is wonderful, and I think probably I carry those ideas forward. Um, but you're asking me about success, and I'll just say, and like drive, what drives you. Like for me, it's always just been um, what will happen next, and, it's, and I approach it like a practice, a, a curatorial practice rather than a studio practice, but just going to see what's around that next corner, like I'm always interested in that. Do I am in the practices of artists that, um, mean enough to me that I want to show their work and, and help them and broker those ideas because that's what we get to do. We get to broker um, ideas, right? 
And, um, and I didn't want to work with institutional timelines because you, you would apply or you would wait within the administration to see if you'd get the green light on a project that you'd be able to do two years from now. Well, I, I wanted to kind of keep enough psychic space open and do things when I wanted to, right? Rather than wait the waiting game or if I'll be able to do it two years down the road. So that um, is invigorating to be able to expedite ideas when you think of them. And at this stage, I expedite um, seasons, like arcs of programming. And, and I have two spaces so I can think about two shows and how they speak to each other or tease ideas out of each other. So I'm thinking about these uh, pairings and then how those pairings work over a whole season or a six month period. And um, so all the balls that are in the air that end up getting anchored on the calendar maybe a year from now, but I know they're going to happen. I know a year in advance they're going to happen. So I, I can build towards, I mean, I'm building towards things all the time. And so that's, that's I think, only invigorating. Um, I think that, that that ability to be able to respond really quickly is something that I love about working in a commercial contemporary gallery. Um, and uh, David, the gallery founder, had actually asked me the other day, he goes, why did you never go into sort of the art auction market or the auction houses, things like that, um, or the institutions? Like, why would you not go and curate? And I'm like, well, I, I don't like those sort of levels of institutional bureaucracy that you have to deal with and the idea that you're going to formulate a show and then you have to wait for money to come in or it's programming you know, two, three years out, something like that. Whereas if you're running a space, uh, particularly, I mean, in Toronto, in Winnipeg, in Edmonton, you can respond very quickly to things that are happening. Um, and that's why I really in enjoy this, this sort of world that we work in. You can literally wake up one day if you're inspired by something you saw or yeah. someone you met and you formulate an idea for an exhibition or you can make it, you just do it. Yeah. You don't need to go to five layers of management, yeah. you don't go to, need to go to a board of directors, you don't yeah. need to do any of that. You don't have to answer to anybody except right. for yourself and your artist. Exactly. Really. Like and the, the sculpture that we're showing here uh, Mitch Mitchell's boombox, literally the glue is probably still wet on it. Like it came out of the studio the day that we installed it here. And the ability to be able to pull something out of an artist's studio and be able to show it immediately. Um, exactly. Well, but, but in all fairness, like from the institution standpoint, I think about the Stephen Andrews show that um, we had in Toronto in 2015 and it was the fourth floor. And it was a show that took five years to get off the ground and the curators changed and um, you know, and I had, I kept pushing for the idea and it ended up happening, um, but um, eventually, uh, I mean, it was so nimble that the final large space of that show, uh, Stephen was given entree to produce new work for it. So those, those things can happen, Absolutely. but, um, but um, I wasn't susceptible to the idea of becoming institutionalized uh, for the reasons that we've already talked about, um, although I do come out of um, academia as well with a degree in English literature and understanding um, history and the history of ideas, you know, and, and um, through literature gaining insight into the art, the politics, um, uh, the social hierarchies, all those things that happen in a given society in, in a given time in a given century, right? And having that longer view. Um, at this stage, I, one of my big things is um, uh, legacy building. And, um, and that's, a, that's more than just a full-time job when you're thinking about artists who are reaching a certain level of maturation and are they adequately recognized in our permanent collections? Are they recognized enough in each of those collections when you have a career that spans 40 years? And maybe they have an early work, but that doesn't mean they, they've taken care of that artist in their collection. It's um, what are these artists doing now? What did they do in between that makes sense? And, and look, at least having three works that can reflect a practice that makes the artist feel good about that being um, a working combination that will survive the artist, right? So, you know, I came into this wanting to help support living culture, but now I'm looking at culture beyond the living and how we can support that for future generations. And that's very energy giving.
right? Exactly. I always so. feel that whatever we do and whatever you do, that we should leave it in a better state than when we found it. Uh, whatever contributions we can make uh, to artists, to, to programming, to showing and educating, that there's a kind of a responsibility. I think uh, people think that really this is all about sales. And I think sometimes, uh, as much as we need the money to move forward and to accomplish what we want to accomplish, I don't think anybody actually does it with that idea. I think it's about uh, creating culture, supporting artists, and then as you start to do it more and more, you realize that there is a big responsibility to actually do it right, get it right, be respectful to artists, uh, bring out the best of them, uh, and then kind of sit, help them get situated uh, in a meaningful way. Do you find that that makes sense, Lisa? Oh, yeah. We were actually speaking about this just before and how do you measure success? Um, what, what does that mean? And um, I think for me, it's, it's not about the financial side. I mean, obviously, you need to make money to keep moving forward. But I think I mark success by when an artist that I work with gets a show at an institution, exactly. an artist is picked up by another gallery in another country, or um, an artist is written about, and there's something that becomes very tangible. And like you were speaking about legacy, where there's now written record of this artist producing this show. Um, contributing to the culture of our country is also something that's really important to me. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, it's definitely not about the money. <laughs> yeah. Coffee, coffee shops make money, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there is a predicament though that institutions live with and that's having enough funds to purchase what they want uh, mm -hmm. rather than to consider what um, a collector is may be interested in donating to them and, and then digging deeper, why does the collector donate or why do they donate to one institution over another? Is that donation going to replace a purchase and um, why isn't that acquisition's money there? Um, what does that say about the community the institution's in and, um, and abilities to raise funds in order to purchase work so that money can go back in exactly. to the system. And it, I mean, it happens, clearly, but um, there are some institutions that can't afford um, beyond the operations of the facility to purchase, and so they kind of rely on, on, on donations, but are they shaping the collection that they actually want, or the one that they're able to get um, because of the vagaries of the market that would lead a collector to say, here, you can have this, and what does that, I mean, what does that really give the institution to work with? Exactly, and I think what you're, what you're, what you're both kind of just kind of alluding to and touching on is something that totally fascinate, fascinates me, uh, and how the role of the gallery is changing uh, today, uh, especially in relation to how we work with institutions. Uh, and museums and artist-run centers and, and all the other platforms in between. Uh, I think globally, and I think we, we see it in Canada now, that uh, museums uh, and institutions are looking to galleries to kind of fill in uh, and to do what they can no longer do uh, because of dwindling budgets, huge expenses of running these major institutions. Uh, they're always looking for money. Uh, and then I find that maybe it's a bit more evident with the large blue chip galleries uh, uh, in, the, in Europe and the States, but they're looking for uh, donations, they're looking for money for catalogs, they're looking for partnership to, to mount exhibitions, to loan works. Do you find uh, what Paul was just kind of saying and, and mentioning, do you find that that's something that's happening in Canada? But do you kind of agree with that statement or that kind of approach that we're, we're being asked, I think, more and more, even if it's auctions, uh, we're being kind of asked to, to participate and take a bigger role uh, in, in that aspect? Yeah, I mean, I think if, as we've discussed, the auctions themselves just become, in Edmonton in particular, they become very problematic. And we are certainly asked to participate um, in our local auctions there. Um, and they're asking for work from artists who they're not necessarily coming back and supporting either. So it does become problematic. Um, and it's detrimental to the artists, any, any market that we attempt to build there. Um, I find that we do have really good institutional relationships and people are asking for a lot more from us these days. Um, 
but the fact that they, they have no acquisitions budget, this becomes really difficult because we've been approached on a number of occasions by institutions who want works, but they're like, well, now we, we need to find the money to do this, so we'll come back exactly. to you when we find the money. Um, and sometimes they, you know, they can't find the money in time, or you know, works get placed elsewhere. But we don't really like. How long do you just sit on a on a piece when you don't know if they're going to find exactly the money to right. to purchase it? I find a lot also is that when we do make a sale to an institution, uh, and that kind of is something. Um, and it was it, not that it happens a lot, but we do focus a lot on that, trying to get works into institutions. Yeah. It it makes us feel good that we're we're doing that. Yeah. But it'll be uh, the situation will be we'll buy this piece, but then we'd like to have a donated piece yeah. Yeah. in addition, mm -hmm. and then can you afford five thousand dollars for the catalog? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the little bit of money that you made on one side, right. uh, and you can't say. I mean, how do you say no? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because you can't say no. So, do you find? I mean, I'm sure, Paul, you've encountered that that sort of situation uh, in your experience. But uh, but I guess we just have to keep saying yes, yes, yes. I, I think you you sort of need to look at it in the bigger picture too, where institutions are really going to take care of this work. This is work that will hopefully be seen. The your your sort of giving it over to someone who's going to become the caretaker for this work so that future generations can see this. So I think you have to sort of measure what what is the value of the work. Um, I mean, first and foremost, you want that artist to, to have money in order for them to keep producing and to sustain their livelihood as an artist. Um, so so you, you sort of need to measure what is the value for the piece to be preserved in, uh, f like, with this legacy aspect again, or is it more important for the artist to have <laughs> this money? And I think that that's where it sort of becomes. I I'm all for the idea of if you're going to acquire something, yeah, we'll figure out a way to donate something in addition, because you certainly you want if there's one piece that somebody's looking at and you know that they need two or three to really get the whole context of what that, that body of work is about and it's not going to be well represented in the collection without more, then that's what you absolutely should do. Um, but whether you're in the financial position to be able to do that, that's sort of, that's the other another, side of that. Another trick you can do is uh, try to encourage your, your clients absolutely. and your collectors yes. to donate, to yeah. buy one yeah. and then donate another. I mean, that, that uh, obviously is more possible, the, you know, the more affluent, the more, uh, right. uh, so uh, you can do that also. That's another little trick. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that in that situation, that it's often the the collectors or the clients that we have that are able to perhaps fund acquisitions or force certain criteria on acquisitions. Um, we were really lucky. The installation, not really lucky, sorry. The, the work is absolutely amazing, um, but it's an, incredible that it happened this quickly. But the work that we showed at Art Toronto last year, um, there's a large scale installation, Ruth Cut Hands, Don't Breathe, Don't Drink, which is an incredible installation. And some private collectors stepped forward um, and basically funded the acquisition for the Art Gallery of Ontario. So that's going into their permanent collection. Nice. But what they, yeah, the official announcement will go out next week. Um, but basically what they stipulated is, look, we will, we will help fund this acquisition, but it needs to be on permanent exhibition. And you need to loan it out to other institutions that we want this work seen and we want it seen as widely as we can across Canada. So, you know, in that situation, they had the, the sort of power to be able to say that and to state those things mm. where we, we did not, so. Exactly, very nice. Uh, and I think that kind of highlights, uh, there's the museums, there's the artists, there's the galleries, but in my mind, uh, kind of like that last wild card, the unknown element of it is the collector. Mm -hmm. uh, and they play a huge role in kind of determining uh, what happens to a p uh, artwork how it's contextualized, how it's seen. Um, once they purchase it, uh, it goes. And if they're responsible, then they can uh, treat it responsibly. But, but right. that kind of highlights uh, something that I'm always telling artists that as much as what we do to keep the integrity of the artwork and to present it in according to our vision, uh, once a collector buys it, it's kind of like the third element of the equation. 
Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, I think as you become more established too, uh, you, you get to be a little bit more picky and choosy about where you're placing these works. Um, sometimes I feel not disappointed, but um, I, I want to have more control over where the works are going to go because I want them to be seen again. I don't necessarily always want them to go into a private collection, um, but obviously in the beginning years, you, you're still trying to make sales in order to go forward. So um, you, you probably get to, to do that a little bit more. <laughs> I mean, you know, we have, we have private collectors, we have corporations, and we have institutions, and they're all, you know, doing their thing, and we're helping to connect them with work. We're, I mean, primarily we're, you know, connecting art with an audience, and then it turns into what it turns into. And we do have this idea of uh, being a bit of a, a gatekeeper on how that right. plays out. And, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very active collector, you know, and I, I get to see things before anybody else sometimes, and I, I, get, I get to decide if I will step in right away or if I'll just let the fates determine how things go and, and see how the show does and make a decision later if I do. Um, and I mean, I actively collect the artists that I show, right? Yeah. Um, and, um, and beyond, I'm looking at something at the fair right now, I'm very excited, and um, see how that plays out. But do you, do you ever feel like you're in the power to I've not sold where? work to somebody. Yeah, that's oh, what, yeah, no, if, yeah. If, I, if, it, if, if I think they're disgusting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, I mean, yes, I agree. Those, <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm getting all riled. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> for sure. I, mean, I find it rudeness. If somebody is rude to me, mm -hmm. uh, I've said no. Yeah. I've said no. I just, I think that it's, we have to keep, I think the most important element of this is that we have to keep our dignity. We treat everybody with dignity and I find it really uh, humiliating and upsetting that when somebody kind of crosses the line with me. So mm -hmm. I have said no uh, and then I feel guilty after, but I, maybe I regret it, but in the end, uh, artists understand. So yeah. have, you, have you ever said no? I'm trying to, th um, I've said no to people who have asked to pay like a fraction of the yeah. price. That's, that's sometime when I'm like, no, you know, the artist, we set the price at what it is, you know, and yeah, I could go. I, I, I know could, what you mean. Yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> I've said, I've said, I'm sorry, but I don't think this is working. Okay. That's yeah. a nice way. Yeah. I, I find that, that if, um, you know, when, when people disrespect the art and the artist that's when I have no problem saying no yeah, like I was sure. at an art fair uh, not with DC3 but with the previous gallery in New York and a collector came up and said how much is this and I said it's twenty thousand dollars he goes it's not worth more than 15. I just turned around and walked away and I was like if that's what you think that's fine but you know like I believe in this work I believe in this artist and I'm not continuing this conversation right now yeah and we don't arbitrarily price work either there's so much thought that goes into each piece so if you're a budding collector <laughs> exactly you know, I don't I don't think nothing is random yeah, no. we agonize and do research uh, to establish prices for works and see where they fit into the market everything is very carefully considered so and speaking of market, uh, so two things I want to ask you. I know we're, we're kind of coming near the end of the talk before we get to questions, but <clears throat> one of the biggest questions that I get asked all the time is uh, how do I choose the artists that I'm going to work with? So I think we kind of all know the answer to that, but I think uh, for people, kind of, especially artists that are looking to get into a gallery and looking to be represented by somebody and looking to join someone's program, is there even a way to answer that question? I mean, I, th I think that the artists that we work with are artists that um, they're rigorous and they're dedicated. Um, they're dedicated to their practice as an artist. Um, but it's also work that is part of a larger conversation that goes outside of the, the region in which we exist and work that we feel confident that we can take to you know, to bring here to Montreal or bring to Basel or bring to New York, something like that, and work that's going to stand up as rigorous and as contemporary and as part of a larger conversation. Um, I was speaking to somebody about this the other night as well, and one of my, my sort of 
personal standards is it also has to be somebody I enjoy working with because working in running a, a gallery it's very much a passion project you know it's not it's not a job it's a life and you put your heart and your soul into it and it's exhausting and it's really fulfilling but I have to work with people that I enjoy working with and that also there's a mutual respect there it's it you know there's lots of really great artists um, but if you're if you're difficult or if you don't appreciate what I do for you, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to work with somebody who does. So. And I was kind of getting at that when I talk about how uh, on a certain level we're, we're, we, we are brokers of ideas and mm -hmm. you, you know, you're either supporting that idea thoroughly or you're not having anything to do with it. I agree. I think that's a great comment because I think I, it's nice to see products and it's nice to see what work has been created, but it really is all about ideas. Uh, and the individual and uh, the way that they think, uh, the ideas that they're investigating, what it means. And then I worry about products later. I don't really uh, focus too much on whether this is red, that's blue, whether that's a painting, whether that's a sculpture. Uh, do you find the same thing, Lisa? Um, yeah, I mean, you have to buy into the idea first and foremost. Um, I feel like I get asked all the time because again, being one of the only commercial galleries in Winnipeg, I'm approached consistently about showing artists. And for me, I, I choose really, it's, it's usually based on my emotional reaction to the work. Um, and then comes the, how are you to work with? Because <laughs> yeah. you don't always know too. You can be so um, passionate about an idea and, and I'll push it, I'll, I'll work with difficult people um, if I really believe in that idea, but you also have to be really careful about how much uh, you're putting of yourself into a project if you're not getting that back, and it, it can wear you down completely. And I mean, I'm only, I'm like, I'm a toddler in the world of commercial galleries, but I feel a bit of a burnout at this point too, working with artists and, and, and trying to um, keep pushing forward and you do have to be very careful about who you're going to put your energy and your well your your money your heart your soul everything into if it's not going to come back so I agree I think yeah it really does get to the point for me personally if it's not making me happy I don't want to do it uh, whatever it is uh, so I think that really you can't work and be creative, and I'm sure everybody here in the audience agrees, you really can't work and be creative unless you're happy. Uh, I mean, if you're miserable, maybe great work comes out of it, but, but uh, not for us. Uh, so, so the big other question is... That sounds a little bit of like first world problem-y in a certain kind of way. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that there are things that need to be seen and that you may not it may not line up for you on every level, but the work also needs to be shown. And so that's a good point. You do you do take yourself out of the equation? But you know, it's a, it's um, it's a you, you think it through. You think yourself out of the equation in yeah. order to support something, and and you may feel a bit differently about it after it's happened. You don't know, but you can sense. You can right. sense. So that's, yeah, that's, I agree. That's, that's, that's a good point. Exactly. Which kind of just totally refutes what I just said. But in a way, but, uh -huh. hey, uh -huh. there's different points it's a of panel, view. And there's but, an audience with questions. No, I do agree. I mean, <laughs> so uh, okay. I so get where you're coming. I mean, sure. Yeah, but I mean, but you do agree that you don't want to be miserable every day. And but and happiness do doesn't necessarily need to come from <laughs> the the relationship that you have with the artist. It can come from the joy of or the the satisfaction of knowing that this project is now going to be seen and there's people responding to it because it's an important idea that you're presenting. So that's exactly. what I mean when I say I'll work with difficult like people who are maybe a little bit more difficult if I think right. in the end that this is something worth putting your okay. your. I mean, if Back all you see is a bundle energy. of handling instructions <laughs> and not the work or the, you know, yeah. then sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And speaking of making decisions, yes. uh, you've all come from different areas of the country and you're all doing kind of off-site projects and, and going elsewhere. And you are constantly, I'm sure, uh, faced with making decisions on what you're going to show where. So here you are in Montreal, you've come to Papier. How did you make the decision of what you were going to show today, this weekend, in your booths. Uh, was it, what was the thought process, Lisa? <laughs> uh, 
Well, yeah. and tell me, and this is actually a great yeah. opportunity to tell people where you are and what you're showing, and that oh, they yeah. should come see it, and yeah. <laughs> and why why you're showing that. Yeah. And I'm gonna we're gonna go to every single person All and right. ask that exact same question. <laughs> Um, so I'm the first booth when you, you come in, so booth C01. Um, I have Paul Robles and Jeanette Johns, Ted Barker, and then I have a few other pieces, um, uh, some small collages by Guy Madden, and then a couple of portfolios in the back too. Um, I think what, for Papier, uh, I work with a lot of artists who deal, who work in paper. Um, so this this fair is always like a no-brainer for me, but um, this this time I think what I really tried to do was bring um, artists that I hadn't that I felt like I hadn't been giving enough attention to, um, and and I wasn't necessarily thinking about the Montreal market, which was maybe <laughs> not the smartest decision, <laughs> but um, just thinking about who whose work I believe in that hasn't had enough attention yet. Um, and so with Paul Robles, I brought his work because we had a show in Winnipeg. And again, I didn't feel like enough people saw that work. So I brought some key pieces from that so that it could be seen by a wider audience. Same thing with Jeanette Johns. We had a beautiful exhibition of hers in Winnipeg. Again, there's just not a lot of people that were able to come see it because we live in Winnipeg. So I wanted to give her that opportunity. Um, and then with, uh, with Ted Barker, again, it had been a year since I had shown anything by him, uh, so I brought, brought his work along too. So that's, that's, I, it's, it's usually about who I feel um, is ready and, and deserves some, some love. <laughs> what, sort of, what sort of reaction and questions are you getting about the work so far? Um, oh, it's kind of all over the place. Nobody really believes that Ted Barker's work is really graphite. <laughs> they all think it's photographs. Um, so there's really a lot of interesting conversations around that. Um, with, uh, with Paul Robles, um, people are, are interested in the whole process of his work because it's like a five layer process, which he does um, mono prints hand cut collages. They're very interesting. You should, well, I'm not going to talk more about them. You have to actually come see them. <laughs> okay, Michelle? Um, so we've been doing Papier Art Fair since 2013 when David first opened the gallery. As a gallery, we have a very difficult relationship to the market in Montreal. Um, so we tend not to sell a lot of work when we come to the, the art fair here. People are slowly starting to recognize what we do and who we are. Um, but basically this year, you know, when we first we were thinking about what are we going to show, and Mitch Mitchell's work um, seemed like the obvious choice, we first approached Mitch and said, look, let's... I don't know if you've seen it, we're in booth A10, but we've got a pile of boxes in the corner. And our first idea was like, let's just pile the whole booth full of boxes, 35,000 boxes and kind of and walk away. Um, but then Mitch came to us and said, well, look, I, there's actually this project that I'm working on called Box Factory. Um, and, you know, I think I can pull together the first sort of vignette of the Box Factory project for Papier. And we said, you know, this is a brilliant idea. It would sort of get the project out there. It's going to be a, a project that will, I would assume, take five years for him to complete. Um, but it's a very large scale, multi-component, kinetic and auditory sculpture that he's working on. So for us to bring a portion of this here um, and to be able to show it and get some curatorial eyes on it was really important. And Mitch is based here in Montreal as well. so. Um, it just it made sense and it was sort of time to time to show this project here and then you know as he's showing us the sketches and the ideas that he has and we're like wait we, we gotta have a functional record player in our booth this is gonna be fun so what sort of reaction I, on opening night it was a big hit yeah uh, how are your booth neighbors reacting to all the, the I music? was a little concerned <laughs> um, and Parisian Laundry is on the one side of us and I, I sort of yeah. said to Megan at the beginning I'm like I'm, I wasn't really sure if people are gonna love us or hate us yeah. um, but People and I ran over and told you, you that I, I, I DJ vinyl in yeah. Toronto, and I kept uh. thinking I was hearing ESG. It's just you hear the drum and bass. That's yeah. what sort of really yeah. comes down the aisle. Yeah. Um, and I've been loving it as a little uh, nice. backdrop or sound bed to the yeah, whole Yeah, I get to spin right after this. So. <laughs> the, re the reason I ask is the very first year we did uh, Volta Basel uh, in 2014, we arrived and we set up our booth and we were all ready to go. Yeah. Uh, and then we started to smell cigarette smoke. 
And we thought, what's going on? I mean, I know Europe, everybody, it's different right. smoking laws. Yeah. Uh, and then we were starting to cough and we were un uncomfortable for the first two days. And then we discovered that the gallery behind us had uh, an automated cigarette smoking machine as part of their installation. Oh, no. And it was, they had, and they didn't have Ameri like nice North American cigarettes. Right. They had hand rolled European <laughs> yeah. that were, um, and it was this big, uh, sculpture that with a conveyor belt that was feeding cigarettes into this machine and the machine was pretending to smoke them and wow. and by the third and the, it's a long fair yeah. it's about seven eight days about the third day we had we were convinced we had pneumonia we had <laughs> cancer uh so then so that's why i'm, I'm always kind of considering now when we come up with all our brilliant ideas for the right. booths i think okay we can't subject the other people uh, to this, so but right. music is different. Yeah, so. and I mean, we invite people in to come. And, you know, you don't like what we're playing? Come pick a record, yeah. right? So <laughs> it's very interactive, and, and people have been and wonderful. The machine responsive. housed in plexi, and you could see all the residues from the cigarette on the inside, coating the. Exactly, it was part of a, it was part of a bigger installation. So, uh, <laughs> but we, you know, we we put up with it, but it wasn't a great experience. Paul, you, how did you decide? Um, well, Tell us about your booth and where it is. There's, oh, I'm in um, B08, so I'm just outside here at the next aisle on the corner. Um, on the outside of our booth are collage works by Gary Evans. It's a, it's a, um, a solo project with Papier. Um, I show artists at all stages of their uh, career development, emerging, mid-career, established, uh, and senior. And um, um, it's always interesting to me to see what I wind up bringing here and that really isn't formalized until I'm in the booth dealing with the consequences of what I just couldn't bear to leave in Toronto and include in the shipment. <laughs> um, but there were certain guiding, um, guiding things. Um, I brought a Sleeping Places photograph by Marlene Kreitz from 1982. It's sort of her seminal work where she photographs the forest floor or the meadow or the, or the grass wherever she, uh, uh, where she slept for the night. So it's the impression that's left behind. And uh, this is very important work. And uh, she has a retrospective opening at the Beaver Brook in September. So it's, um, it's a platform to talk about that um, what's coming up with Marlene and she was also born in Montreal so it's just nice to bring things back and and to talk about it from that standpoint as well um, and uh, we're showing Zachary Logan we're sort of featuring him in the catalog so I devoted one wall to his work and um, uh, Miles Collier younger artist very exciting um, early career developments in the last year where he's had shows at my gallery and at YYZ and at the Art Gallery of York University and really excited about the, this work and we're going to be hearing more and seeing more um, and I'm excited about that so I thought I would bring a little bit of his work but also I'm hanging it with Stephen Andrews work and there's an enormous interplay between these artists of different generations and um, um, you know Ideas don't come and go, they keep going and they get it added on to and we see it differently and all that kind of thing. So I've, I mean, I, um, I delight in those combinations and I, I probably think it through a lot more than I need to from an art fair mm -hmm. standpoint, but I only know one way of doing things and so I just honor that. Exactly. So th that kind of brings me to uh, something that I constantly consider uh, and I'm sure that you do too. When you are deciding all of this, how, how much, what's the balance between kind of creating the market, working with an artist that you believe in, and then putting it out there and then working very hard to educate, to show, to support, and create a new idea and create something that's new versus kind of making decisions that feed into the market. Uh, and choosing an artist that you love and that you like the work, but you know it's going to re it's going to be immediate. People know the work, the artist. So how, what's the balance? Is that kind of a, a daily decision? Is it? It sounds, Paul, like you've already, you can. I mean, we I think we all consider this on a regular basis, and I'm always a little bit torn. I trust my instinct. My instinct is kind of to to create and to educate and to wait until the market catches up. But then sometimes I think maybe the other one makes more sense. I think the conviction has to be around the work 
and then the chips fall where they do. It's really as simple as that. So you just let it happen. I mean, you, you, as long as you believe in it, you stay focused, and then... Well, I wouldn't be showing it otherwise, right? right. So what would be the point? I, I'm, I'm not interested in, in work that becomes complacent or market-driven. I just, you know, it doesn't even, I don't, you know, those, you know, those things don't, they're not on my playing field. Perfect. Michelle? Um, somebody came up to us, actually a couple of people came up to us at Art Toronto this past year and said, oh, you guys are the ones that always bring the unsaleable work to the art fair. And I was like, I'll take that as a reputation. Um, obviously, that's not necessarily true, um, hence the, the placement of the work. But um, we tend to try and approach fairs as exhibitions. And with a lot of the artists that we work with, we know that the work's not going to find a home immediately. And it's going to be you know, three years, five years, perhaps, until the market catches up. Um, but we believe in the work, and we believe in the artists. So we, you know, luckily, we're in a position where we can we have that sort of lag of time and we can pre present this work and knowing that it might not come back um, for a while. Lisa? Yeah, I think the same. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you can actually even really understand the Canadian market. Um, I mean, if there was a simple algorithm that's like, yep, this is going to sell, or wasn't it, there that Baldessari shirt that or shirt, work, uh, I have it as a shirt, so, um, where it's like, uh, landscapes do well, uh, works with blue, yeah. you know, there's this whole, yeah. this whole, whole thing, but I, um, I think if you're only going to work, there are certainly galleries out there that do that, that just put up work that they know will sell, um, that, you know, that's not my intention ever, mine is to work with artists whose ideas I believe in first and foremost and to um, yeah like I guess create a market ar around that to, to mm -hmm. try and educate as much as I can yep. about why this work is important and this idea. I find any time that I've tried to do anything different where I think okay I like this and I feel it's gonna sell and we need to have an exhibition that sells things fall flat <laughs> yeah. they yeah. really do so I think yeah. that it's, it's I've, unpredictable yeah right. so uh, and things don't always work the same two times in a row. Uh, so again, Paul, you're right. Just trust your instinct, stay committed, do what you're doing, uh, and uh, that's the only way to do it. So maybe what I'm thinking, maybe one final question, and then we can open it up uh, to questions. Uh, what's the dream list? What's the wish list for your gallery? What is it that, as you look forward, uh, your secret wish list what do you still want to do, Lisa? Ooh. Everything. <laughs> yeah, I want it all. Um, I think, in the end, it's about getting the artist who I believe in to a point where they are able to do this um, to sustain their careers, getting them museum shows, um, that, or, or even into a position where um, where they feel that their work is now understood um, better. It's, it's us for me, it's, about, it's all about the artists. Um, I, so get doing more fairs, getting more international recognition so that um, that then comes back to the artists. That's, the, I guess that would be my, my dream. Excellent. But, yeah. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Michelle? Um. I feel like I've checked a lot of things off that dream list already this year. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, being able to place a major work in a major institutional collection for me was a, a huge accomplishment. Um, and nothing felt better than being able to write a huge check to that artist and knowing that what she did immediately is went down to the local store and started trying to source a hundred gray army blankets for her next big project. And just knowing that she now has the money to pursue this next project that she's been thinking about for five years. Um, you know, for us, showing in New York was on that bucket list of things, and showing in Basel was in that bucket list of things. So I can't think beyond that right now. My sort of that's where my mindset is, is focusing on um, on Europe, and we'll see how things go after that. Do you and David sit down and plan things for the future, or is it kind of organic and you sit 
just kind of like let it happen and I mean with a, I don't mean to make to minimize it but right. do you take it as it comes or do you sit down and work out a three and five year plan or the, all the things you'd like to achieve and accomplish yeah I mean I think that um, the fair in New York and the fair in Basel those were a five year plan so we were not expecting to be going this year um, so we just sort of take it as it comes. Um, we do plan things out though, you know, we have programming planned out 12, 18 months. We are looking at sort of what are the cities that we need to be in, what artists do we need to have in what cities, what curators need to be looking at what artists in our program. Um, so we do plan things out, but we're also very organic within yeah. that and, and able to t respond to what's happening. Paul, we bow down to you. I'm just looking what? forward to the swimming pool I found that I can go to tomorrow morning because I've been a, away <laughs> from it for six days. And, <laughs> and you're going crazy. Little, like, uh, um, it's, just, it's just not enough to sit and stand. I want to swim. <laughs> <laughs> so what incredible things do you have planned for all of us? That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. That's all I'm thinking about right now. Is okay. The, I'm thinking about questions from the audience. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. We've talked enough. I'll turn around. Excuse my back. I'll drain that. So... Uh, questions. What I would like to know if it is relevant for, for you or important or pertinent to situate whatever you show in some kind of a trend or approach or category, such as, especially I'd be curious, uh, figurative, abstract, modern, contemporary, conceptual, or digital, con uh, uh, digital or cyber art. These six categories of art, do you think about it where your gallery fits I in? I totally resist that whole categorization That's what I want to know. Um, okay. idea. I think of myself as being content driven, okay. and I'm not wedded to any particular medium. Okay. Oh. I would, I would agree. Um, I don't think we we try and I don't think we try and focus on any particular categories. Um, it, it has to be about the artist and the work. Same. Right. <laughs> I, I find that today I think it's impossible almost to do that because uh, a painter suddenly is, is a digital artist. A digital artist is suddenly a sculptor. Uh, a sculptor. I mean, it's all about basically ideas, and I think that there are so mediums, so many mediums that are available to artists now that nobody really. It's nobody not as if those words aren't in our vocabulary, but that's that's language that comes out when you're having to. Um, translated for somebody else, right? Um, and you're trying to, um, I mean, you're already meeting them halfway because you've made the exhibition and they're there and they're experiencing it, but you know, you learn where they're coming from and, and then you can put words to it that will make it easier for them to understand and maybe some of what you just said will come into play, but uh, it's only temporary. It doesn't, it's not a fixed categorization. Right, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great question. Hi. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Paul said something that I wanted Michelle to comment on about recessions. He said recessions are, sorry, I'm paraphrasing here, but regener regenerative or something to that effect. They're not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're a, a gallerist. I mean, they are because art is yeah. the first thing to go and the last thing to bounce back in a funny way, mm -hmm. but, but from a production standpoint, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. Well, yeah, I want to hear, you're in Alberta, we're in this age of like rock bottom uh, natural resource prices. I do business in Calgary. Uh, yep. The towers are 30, 40% unoccupied, yep. uh, including the largest tower in Canadian history that's now, nobody's in it. It's a lot of empty walls for art, but, um, <laughs> How do you look at that? Comment on that from an Albertan uh, perspective, please. Um, I mean, the DC3 Art Projects hasn't been around that long, and 
to be honest, we don't do that much in terms of sales. So um, the recession hasn't affected us that much. I have found a lot of people are offloading art, so we are getting opportunities to do, there's a lot of people approaching us with secondary market things, a lot of corporate collections that are trying to sell off what is currently in their offices. Um, but there's nobody really that is that is looking to buy those pieces right now. Um, so we haven't been, I wouldn't say we've been affected by the recession that much, um, but it's definitely on people's minds, right? I'll just say one thing. Uh, I, I, in my mind, there are 7.3 billion people on the planet, and I've always in my, in my brain kind of thought, if I can just get 100 of them around the planet to be uh, kind of faithful clients or, or uh, support us, so I've always thought that um, even during, like Paul says, sometimes during recession, we, we don't feel it. Uh, we continue to do well because I've always uh, looked to cast a very wide net uh, and not focus geographically on what we do. And, and starting off in Ottawa, I had the gallery in Ottawa uh, eight, nine years before I opened up here in Montreal uh, two years ago. Uh, so I couldn't sustain uh, my gallery just by uh, focusing on the Ottawa market. Uh, it just doesn't work. So I was lucky. It was depressing at first, but I was lucky when I realized that I had to, sur to survive and to do well, and not just financially, but creatively, we had to kind of look beyond, uh, look beyond Ottawa, look beyond Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, and look beyond Canada. And I found that I started to have a little bit of success once I went to the international market and did a few things, then suddenly everybody in Canada started to notice that we had something interesting going on. But Canada did not validate me or my artists or even, I don't know if they have, but maybe that's the wrong word, but it didn't start to go well here until we left the country and did things elsewhere and then came back. So that was kind of our plan to make us a little bit recession proof. Yeah. Has anyone experienced that? Certainly, and I think that uh, you know a lot of our a lot of the business that we do is not based in Edmonton and it's not based in Alberta. Um, you know that's why we are in Los Angeles, we are in New York, we are going overseas, right? Um, because Edmonton hasn't has not actually been that uh, responsive to what we're doing at this point in time. Right. Even in the in the last little while, the last month or so, we've shipped out works to Chicago, New York. Mm -hmm. um, Hong Kong, uh, and London, yep. and nothing here in Montreal, yep. uh, and one client in Toronto. So, yep. so you just can't wait until yep. the, someone comes knocking at your door. Right. Yeah, we're very invisible, I find, in Edmonton. Um, right. We had a, the other week we had the Art Gallery of Alberta's curator circle come into our gallery for an event. There was, I think, 35 people, and so these are people that obviously support contemporary culture in, in Edmonton. One of them had been in our gallery before. <laughs> exactly. The others had never stepped foot in there before. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, this is more of a, uh, back on a story by Michelle, uh, this collector that you guys had who really put a command that it had to be shown all the time. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering a couple of tips on how do you build these relationships with particular collectors? How do you find them out? How do you build them up and build the relationships in the longer term? Um, I think it's about, uh, I mean, I think that it's about the art and the artist first and foremost. I think that um, you know these people in particular have a really strong relationship to that artist and to that work. Um, so I think that that has to be at the front of things. And then it's about developing a you know it's it's been an ongoing relationship where it's about developing mutual respect. Um, and you know I don't. If I meet a potential client or collector or somebody who's interested in the work, I don't want to. I don't want to push something on them that they're not comfortable with just for the sake of making a sale. I would rather um, develop a mutual respectful relationship over a period of time and sort of introduce them to what we're doing and who we are. Um, that for me is more important. Makes sense. Great. Anybody else? Um, I think you answered one of my questions, which was um, the importance of validation for um, outside Canada um, to basically support or bolster maybe Canadian collector confidence. Um, 
to purchase, so I'll, I won't ask that one further. My, the last part has to do with um, the secondary art market for contemporary art in Canada. We didn't really, you didn't really touch on that in terms of its uh, importance in the Canadian contemporary art market. We don't really have much um, in Canada of secondary contemporary art market. Uh, do you see that as an important area? Say, for example, Waddington's Concrete Contemporary, Stephen Ranger has been trying to develop that for about five years. Do you see that as an important element of trying to kind of grow the overall Canadian contemporary art market? I mean, collectors Im important do Important from whose yeah. standpoint? Well, collectors do need to, for, I know everybody likes to think that art collectors should keep it, but from time to time, collectors may have to you know, sell the art, whether, you know, a variety of reasons, like to have liquidity. So obviously in New York, London, you know, secondary contemporary art auctions is a big part of kind of going back and forth. You can say it supports or doesn't support, I don't know, primary market. What do you think? I think the, I think the, um, uh, the uh, donation idea kicks in for some people when it comes to, uh, but you're talking about people who feel a financial pressure to... Well, you know, there's um, the, 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 the four Ds or <laughs> whatever, like, you know, there's reasons why collectors, artists, an asset, it, people may need to have liquidity from time yeah. to time <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Definitely, Michelle, you would know this also from your experience, but the art market, the second, the art auctions, at Christie's and Sotheby's generate huge amounts of news all around the world and we have this idea that things are doubling and tripling in, in value and something for 10 million sells for 20 million the year after uh, and that there's a, this huge kind of uh, class of billionaires that are roaming the earth buying up everything and gobbling it all up. Uh, is that kind of what you're thinking of? But, or you're, and then I think yeah. that we get this idea that it's happening. For, for me, I mean, uh, I don't really deal very much in the secondary market. I avoid it. I have clients who used to be collectors uh, of our gallery that now have moved into the secondary market, and I don't quite understand it, uh, why they do it. Uh, but I, I focus on the primary market, uh, yeah. and I think that we should be, obviously, I think we would all agree, but more energy and more effort and more f finances, resources should be spent on the primary market. You can't be a secondary market until you're a primary market, so. Yeah, um, there's this case that's happening in, in the States right now where there's a lot of these young artists like Hugh Scott Douglas where his prices went through the roof um, partially because his galleries promoted it and raised his yeah. prices so quickly um, and so many people, collectors, were buying it because they were seeing this um, as a potential flip. And I think that is so damaging to young artists' careers where um, collectors are buying it with a secondary market in mind. Um, so I personally don't deal any at all with secondary market. Um, there are certain galleries throughout Canada. Uh, Mayberry does a really great job doing that. Um, I'm more talking about auction, like secondary market auction, not so much dealers that are doing secondary market dealing. Like, do you think that there's a need for to grow the secondary market auction? I think in there's Canada? a need to grow the primary market. Okay. Uh, and I think that I everyone, mean, I know should, that's all your everyone should resist the auctions and come to our galleries <laughs> and buy and spend whatever they're spending at the auction houses and spend them okay. at our galleries so that we can continue to do wonderful things, support new and emerging artists, put together great projects, and advance culture. Uh, that's kind of what we do. So yeah. whatever you can yeah. do to, to help us yeah. achieve that, Although, great. Yeah, yeah. I, I would... I would um, I would say though that I think that auctions and secondary market does become part of a healthy art ecosystem. Um, and while I love it when people obviously are supporting the primary market, I think that the secondary market does have, there is capacity to develop it further in Canada. Yeah. Um, and you know, like, do you think they interfere with prices? Interfere with pricing and, and Paul? Do you think that that has an element to it where the auctions can kind of set prices higher or lower than where we'd like to see them? Well, that, that suggests that um, auction houses are purveyors of taste or quality, and they're neither of those things. But a less informed public would find direction through the auction activity 
if they um, didn't know better. Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You couldn't have said it better. That's <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, that's the end. There's another, <laughs> there's another uh, panel discussion starting at 2 o'clock. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, go out and look at the artwork. If it's something you can't afford, go to the director of the gallery and say, I love this. How do I get it? How can you make it happen for me? And uh, they will be very happy and accommodating and appreciative. Make sense? <laughs> to an extent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.